Parkinson's. Hello and welcome to the Parkinson's Foundation Northeast Take Time Thursday program. I'm Melody McLaughlin, Community Programs Manager for the New England Chapter of the Parkinson's Foundation. I'm tuning in today from Massachusetts and I encourage you to feel free to share where you're tuning in from via the chat function that Nancy had mentioned. You're not alone and your Parkinson's community is here with you today from near and far. During this time of physical distancing, we hope that you're able to stay safe and healthy at home. In an effort to help you stay connected, the Parkinson's Foundation has been providing weekly educational and wellness programs in a virtual format through our PD Help at Home series. This is still feeling new for all of us, so we thank you in advance for your patience while we're getting used to doing things in a new way. Today's session will be recorded and available on parkinson.org slash pdhealth. Today's Take Time Thursday was made possible by the continued support of local sponsors from across the Northeast region. Today, we thank Accorda Therapeutics. Their ongoing support allows us to offer this unique opportunity to stay connected virtually and to hear from local experts, volunteers, and members of our community. It is now my pleasure to welcome and introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Albert Hung. Dr. Hung is a specialist in the diagnosis and treatment of Parkinson's disease, tremor, and other movement disorders. He completed his MD and PhD degrees at Harvard Medical School and then received training in neurology and movement disorders in the Partners Neurology Program at Mass General Hospital in Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Hung is also the Medical Director of the Parkinson's Foundation Center of Excellence at MGH and the Associate Director of the Movement Disorders Unit. He coordinates a multidisciplinary team of specialists that meet regularly to improve care of PD patients and has organized educational symposia about PD. He's also a member of the Parkinson Study Group and participates in clinical research trials to identify and develop new treatments for PD. Without further ado, Dr. Hung, we're, we're thrilled to have you here with us today to discuss blood pressure and Parkinson's disease. Melanie and Nancy, thanks very much for the invitation to do this. Uh, let me share my slides here and uh, get started. Oops. So uh, thank you for joining us today. These are obviously unprecedented times that we're in in so many ways. And so we really appreciate you making some time in your schedule. You know, I was talking to Mel Melody and Nancy earlier today, and we're obviously all trying to find new ways to do things during the current crisis. And so uh, this is a great way for us to be able to reach people uh, in, in a different way than we are normally used to doing, but um, I'm glad we have the chance to uh, do the things that we love. So as Melody mentioned, uh, the topic of today's uh, discussion is managing blood pressure in Parkinson's disease. And the reason why this topic came up as something to um, think about in this context is that it's something that in the context of Parkinson's often slips between the cracks. You know, when somebody comes to see me as a Parkinson's specialist, there are a lot of things that we talk about and ask about. We ask about tremor, about walking and balance, how people are doing from a physical standpoint. But oftentimes blood pressure is one of those things that we don't pay as much attention to. And when people with PD start to experience fluctuations or problems managing blood pressure, it's not always clear who the right person is to discuss that with. Is it the neurologist or should it be a cardiologist or should it be an internist? Everybody often says, well, you know, talk to your other doctors because it's not really clear who should be managing blood pressure problems when they occur in the context of a neurological condition. So today there's really gonna be three main points to our discussion. The first point is going to be to think a little bit together about blood pressure in general, how blood pressure is regulated and how it goes awry in Parkinson's disease. The second part of the talk will focus on how we can screen for blood pressure problems in Parkinson's disease. And I think that's particularly apropos to this particular concept of PD health at home, because a lot of times we identify and even recognize the severity of blood pressure problems, not when people come into the office, but when you're going about your day-to-day -day activities um, at home or outside. And then the last part of the talk will be really practical approaches to trying to manage blood pressure fluctuations in the context of PD. So before we get too far in our discussion, it's really important to think about what regulates blood pressure. 
You know, when you go to your primary care doctor and you check in with the medical assistant, they check your blood pressure, they check your pulse. Sometimes it's a little bit low, sometimes it's a little bit high. And that measurement that they take can reflect a number of different issues. One issue is obviously the heart, what we call cardiac output. In order for anybody to maintain adequate blood pressure, your heart pump function has to be sufficient to pump the blood through your blood vessels to your brain, to other, all the other organs in your body in order to be able to allow you a blood pressure that is necessary to sustain life. Another factor that regulates blood pressure are the blood vessels themselves. Our blood vessels are not just pipes that, can, uh, that allow blood to flow through, but they're basically surrounded by muscle. And so the blood vessels have the potential to regulate blood pressure on their own, either by, becoming sque uh, by squeezing and becoming more constricted or by dilating and basically dropping the blood pressure in that way. And so our blood vessels contain um, pressure sensors, baroreflexes, which allow the blood to flow through, to get to the brain in ways that are necessary, again, to keep us awake, alert, and doing the things that we wanna do. The last factor that regulates blood pressure is blood volume. No matter how good your heart is, no matter how good the blood vessels are in terms of maintaining blood pressure, if you don't have enough blood, that obviously is gonna cause your blood pressure to drop. So when somebody has a serious bleeding problem, your blood pressure is gonna drop no matter how good your heart is, and your heart and your blood vessels may work hard to compensate, but blood volume is a necessary factor in allowing us to keep the blood pressure up. Now, there are a lot of parts of our day-to-day -day activity that we can control, and then there are a lot of functions that our body does normally that we don't have to control. The body takes care of that on its own. And those functions that our body normally handles without our voluntary thought is what's called the autonomic nervous system, or sometimes people might refer to it as the involuntary nervous system. Our autonomic function basically allows our body to handle day-to-day -day functions without conscious effort or conscious thought. And our autonomic nervous system regulates a whole host of different functions, not only heart and blood pressure, but it regulates our breathing, regulates our bowels, bladder function, sexual function, sweating, a lot of the different functions that our body um, needs to do in order to stay at its best, but where if we had to think about doing all of those functions, well, it wouldn't give us any time or any, uh, uh, any ability to do anything we really wanted to do. So our autonomic nervous system um, is divided into two main functions or two main divisions, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. The sympathetic nervous system is what we think of as a fight or flight response. When there's something that gets our fear up, when we have to run, we want our body to kick in without us having to think about it. When the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, your heart rate goes up, your heart pounds, beats harder, your airway widens to allow you to get more oxygen, you start to sweat, your pupils dilate. You know, so if we think evolutionarily, you know, back in the day, if there was a predator that was coming at us and we had to run, you want your body to be able to respond in such a way where you don't have to command each part of that nervous system to work. There's also the parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and that's the part of our autonomic function that keeps everything um, working in the background. Bowel function, bladder function, keeps our heart rate regular. It lowers our blood pressure when we don't need high blood pressure, and it regulates things like erectile function too. So, Basically, these functions that we know we need for life, but where we don't want to have to think about them all the time, and we don't need them just on an urgent basis, but we want them humming along the way that we want. That's what the parasympathetic nervous system does. This is a diagram of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And this is really, it's, the details here aren't so important, but it's really just to show you that a lot of our autonomic nervous system is regulated by impulses that go from our spinal cord to other organs. And so most of the sympathetic um, function is regulated through neurons, through nerve cells that are in the middle part of our spinal cord, the thoracic spinal cord. The functions that allow us to do uh, most of our parasympathetic function is high up here in the brainstem, 
or down in the sacral cord. This is what regulates our bladder function, um, sexual function. And you can see that all of these various organs receive innervation both from the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And this balance is really required to allow our bodies to do what we need to do. Now, switching to the issue specifically of blood pressure, normally our body responds to maintain blood pressure in a nice safe range, regardless of whether we're lying down, sitting or standing up, regardless of whether we're more active or less active. Most people's blood pressure is in a fairly normal range. And when the blood pressure starts to get high on a more regular basis, this is when you get diagnosed with hypertension and your primary care doctor or your cardiologist may prescribe some blood pressure lowering medications. The biggest problem with blood pressure in Parkinson's disease tends to be low blood pressure, and in particular when people are standing up. And this condition is what we refer to as orthostatic hypotension. The specific medical definition for orthostatic hypotension is a fall in blood pressure that's associated with standing. And it could either be defined by the higher number, the systolic blood pressure, dropping more than 20 points when you go from a sitting to a standing position, or it can relate to changes in the lower number, the diastolic blood pressure, a drop of 10 milligrams, or 10, milli, 10 sorry, it should be 10 millimeters of mercury. Um, so you can either define orthostatic hypotension based on a drop in the higher number or the lower number. And the important thing to know about orthostatic hypotension is it can be due to both neurogenic causes, like what we experience in Parkinson's disease, or it can be related to non-neurogenic causes. It can be symptomatic, where when you stand up, you get lightheaded or dizzy, or it can be asymptomatic. You may stand up, you may feel totally fine, you might not feel the least bit lightheaded or dizzy, but if you or your doctor were to measure your blood pressure, they might still find a significant drop in either systolic or the diastolic reading. When we start to worry about orthostatic hypotension, whether it's in the context of PD or another condition, is when it starts to cause symptoms. And these are some of the most common symptoms of orthostatic hypertension. Many people will say that if they stand up, and especially if they stand up quickly, they will become lightheaded or dizzy. Or they might feel like there's a generalized sense of weakness that just comes on over their body to the point where you feel like you have to sit down in order to make sure that you're, that you're gonna feel okay. When the blood pressure drops enough so that you're not getting sufficient blood to the brain, you might even faint. And this fainting medical term for that is syncope. And so when people start to experience syncope, one of the main um, causes to rule out, especially if a person has Parkinson's disease, is the fact that they are now developing orthostatic hypotension. You can also have just general problems with thinking that are related to orthostatic hypotension. Again, the reason why people get lightheaded or dizzy is that we're not getting adequate blood flow to the brain. And so that can cause us to feel dizzy, but in a more severe case, it can also just affect the way that you think. And especially people who are older may find that when you stand up or try to move around, you start to feel a little bit fuzzy, and that can be a symptom of OH even when people don't actually faint. So why do people get orthostatic hypotension? Well, it turns out that orthostatic hypotension is basically a consequence of gravity. When you stand up, your blood goes down to your legs. That's the reason why sometimes when people are up on their feet for a long time, you might start to get some swelling in your legs. And if you sit down and prop your legs up or lie down, then the swelling goes away. When you stand up and the blood pressure goes to your legs, the way that our body normally responds is to basically cause the blood vessels in the legs to constrict. It pushes the blood back up to the heart, and then from the heart, it can go elsewhere. So this is a little bit of a picture of that. This is the way that our um, body normally, reg normally regulates blood pressure. There's signals that go from the brainstem to the thoracic part of the spinal cord, and then that sends output either to the heart, which is one way to keep the blood pressure up, or it sends a signal to the muscles and the blood vessels in the periphery. And if they squeeze those blood vessels, it increases the resistance. And that along with increasing the strength of your, your heart pumping, your cardiac output, causes the blood pressure to go up. 
It gets detected by these barrel receptors, which are our pressure sensors in the blood vessels, and the signal goes back to the, uh, back to the brain. So there's this feedback loop that allows us to regulate blood pressure in a way that we don't have to think about it. So what happens in Parkinson's disease? Why do we have problems like this? Well, before we think specifically about that, let's just take a step um, and think about what are the general causes of orthostatic hypotension in the context of what we've already talked about. Parkinson's disease is one of the main causes of neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, where there is a defect or a deficit in the way our autonomic nerves are working so that our blood pressure regulation goes awry. There's other Parkinson's-like conditions or synucleinopathies that also can have significant orthostatic hypotension as one of their symptoms. Included among these are multiple system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, or there's a condition where people will get autonomic problems without Parkinsonism. That condition is called pure autonomic failure. And in some of these conditions, like PAF or even MSA, the degree of autonomic dysfunction can be even more profound and occur even earlier in the course of the illness than they do typically with um, regular Parkinson's disease. There's also other conditions that are called small fiber autonomic neuropathies where people can have issues with blood pressure regulation uh, due to a problem with autonomic nervous system function that does not have features of Parkinson's. So Parkinson's is not the only cause, but it's definitely one of the more common causes of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. There's also a, a number of non-neurogenic causes. Medications can cause um, similar blood pressure issues, dehydration, uh, fever, if you have a heart problem, as we've already talked about, or people who are just chronically ill, spending very little time standing or moving around, over time, your body will develop a response where just from deconditioning alone, people can develop a fairly significant amount of orthostatic hypotension, even if there's not another cause identified. So let's think about NOH, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension in the context of Parkinson's disease. It's quite common. It ranges anywhere from 10% to 65%, depending on what studies you look at and depending on how it's measured. And if you take a combination of 25 different studies, uh, what we call a meta-analysis, the estimate is about 30%. So about one in three people have, uh, have orthostatic hypotension at some point during their course of Parkinson's. It's more likely to, advance, uh, to be present in advanced stages of PD, but it can sometimes be present too in earlier stages. And so it's something to watch out for and monitor no matter where along your Parkinson's pathway you are. Uh, and it also, it's important to recognize that Parkinson's disease by itself can cause orthostatic hypotension. But as we'll talk more about, many of the medicines that we prescribe to try to treat Parkinson's symptoms, um, many of the dopamine medications, whether it's levodopa, Cinemet, or the dopamine agonists, will actually make the orthostatic hypotension worse. And this offers some um, challenging dilemmas uh, at times when we're trying to balance uh, treatment of all of these various symptoms. So why do people with Parkinson's get autonomic dysfunction? You know, we think when we're diagnosing PD about its movement symptoms, we think about the parts of the brain that regulate movement, we think about those brain cells that make dopamine, and um, as many of you probably know, uh, we focus a lot on a part of the brain called the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is located here in the middle part of the brain. That's where the dopamine producing neurons live that allow us to regulate movement. And during the course of Parkinson's disease, those dopamine producing neurons are lost. And in order to compensate for those, we have to give medications that allow the brain to make more dopamine in order to improve those motor functions. What this slide shows though is that the changes that we see associated with Parkinson's disease, and in particular, the deposition of this abnormal aggregate of alpha-synuclein is not restricted only to the midbrain and the substantia nigra, but it involves a whole host of other neurons within our nervous system. Some of those are way down here, even below the picture. You can see alpha-synuclein deposits in some of the neurons that are in our gut 
And there's a one, uh, there's a question of whether or not that might be why uh, people with Parkinson's disease may be prone to constipation even very early on. You'll also see alpha-synuclein deposits in the autonomic nerves, in the brainstem, and then over time, it spreads to the higher parts of the brain that regulate our memory, our thought processes. And so you get this layering of symptoms in Parkinson's disease that all of you are probably too familiar with. At the beginning, you may be mostly dealing with a tremor and a little bit of stiffness and slowness, but over time, you get involvement of other non-motor symptoms that can sometimes be as limiting or disabling as the motor symptoms themselves. And so one way to view Parkinson's disease is as an iceberg. Those symptoms that bring you to the attention of your primary care doctor or your neurologist, the tremor, um, some of the slowness, changes in walking or posture, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. That's what we can see. That's what allows the diagnosis to be made. But below the surface, there are many other parts of the brain that are involved. These often are those that regulate some of these non-motor symptoms. And these are not as obvious or apparent unless you are aware of them and bring them to the attention of your doctor. The other important thing to know is that while the symptoms up here at the top, the movement symptoms are often dopamine responsive, many of the symptoms down below are, um, may not respond to dopamine medications. And as we'll get to, in the case of blood pressure, the dopamine medications may actually make um, those symptoms worse rather than better. So let's think a little bit practically now. This is a PD Health at Home lecture. So these are some of the things I want you to think about from the comfort of your own home, because these are screening questions that will help you identify whether neurogenic orthostatic hypotension is something that you should be concerned about. And if so, uh, it's something that you should bring to the attention of your doctors. Have you fainted or blacked out recently? If that happens, especially, these are all related to primarily standing, that might be a sign that that fainting episode was because your blood pressure dropped. Do you feel dizzy or lightheaded? Again, upon standing. Dizziness and lightheadedness is a very nonspecific symptom, and many people experience that for a whole host of different conditions. But if this symptom is something that you primarily experience when you stand up, neurogenic orthostatic hypertension is one thing to be concerned about. Do you have vision disturbances when standing? So when you get up on your feet, do you feel like your, your vision's a little bit blurry or you have to blink your eyes a couple of times before you feel you can see clearly? Do you have difficulty breathing when standing? Do your legs buckle or do your legs get weak? Only again, when standing. You know, people can have leg weakness for other reasons that have nothing to do with blood pressure. But again, when you stand up, blood pools in your legs, your blood pressure drops. If the weakness is associated specifically with that change in position, that's something that's worth, uh, NOH is something that's worth thinking about. There's an interesting symptom that some people experience related to drops in blood pressure that doesn't actually have anything to do with lightheadedness or dizziness. Sometimes when a person's blood pressure drops on standing, they will feel some tightness or discomfort in the neck and upper shoulders, basically the distribution of a coat hanger. And so when people experience coat hanger pain associated with standing and then you sit down and it goes away, a drop in blood pressure is something to think about. You know, there are other conditions that can cause pain or discomfort in that distribution, but they shouldn't only be standing associated. You know, if you have a little bit of arthritis or some aches or pains, that should not be the kind of pain that is associated only with standing. The reciprocal question is, do those symptoms improve or disappear when you sit or lay down? And if they do, and it's again, uh, you're experiencing this positional uh, quality to these symptoms, it might be worthwhile to screen for neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Are the above symptoms worse in the morning or after meals? Now, the reason why this question is relevant is that often when people are lying down for a long period of time, like you are overnight, and then you stand up quickly in the morning, often people will experience the most dramatic symptoms then. The other reason why this is relevant is that um, people with Parkinson's disease tend to have fluctuations in their blood pressure during the course of the day. And in some cases, 
people with Parkinson's experience not only low blood pressure, which is what we're talking about now, but they can have episodes where the blood pressure gets very, very high. And when that happens, the most typical diurnal pattern for that is that the blood pressure tends to be lowest in the morning, tends to be higher as the day goes on. And so that pattern is something that's worth paying attention to. Also, some people with orthostatic hypotension will find out or will find that the symptoms are worse after a big meal. So you eat, you sit down, you have your breakfast, a nice dinner, and you stand up quickly and you feel like you're going to faint in a way that it doesn't happen at other times of day. Have you experienced a fall recently? Now, this is not a very specific symptom um, for people with Parkinson's disease, but if you take this screening question along with some of the other ones, um, again, it can be a little bit of a red flag. And then the last question, again, relates to just this positional quality. Are there any other symptoms, whatever they might be, that you commonly experience when you stand up or within a few minutes of standing, and then if you sit or lie down, they get better? Anybody who's experiencing orthostatic symptoms needs to know what types of conditions will make it worse. Um, and these are really, um, and I view these as lifestyle tips that I often give to my patients who are dealing with these kinds of symptoms because there are things that you can do to avoid this problem or at least minimize it and also to try and prevent it from uh, leading to some kind of more serious event where you faint or you fall um, or you know, worst case scenario, you fall, break a hip, things like that. This is what we're trying to avoid. Alcohol is definitely a factor that will cause your blood pressure to drop. And so I think that this goes along with, you know, when you sit down and have a nice meal, you have a couple of glasses of wine or a beer, that combination of what we normally consider to be a nice normal lifestyle can be a problem when it comes to blood pressure regulation. Heat is another big problem. You know, when we are in any warm weather environment, our blood vessels normally dilate. And so by doing that, the blood vessels, um, it will cause your blood pressure to drop. And so the scenarios to think about this one after a warm shower. So if you're in the shower and you get out and you're feeling a little bit lightheaded, that might be a sign your blood pressure dropped. I've got a picture here of a hot tub. And so, you know, when people get out of the hot tub, you normally feel a little bit lightheaded or dizzy anyway. But if you're having a problem with blood pressure regulation and you sit in the hot tub for too long, you get up, you might faint. That's something to avoid. And sometimes it can just be a matter of getting out into a warmer, wet, uh, warmer weather. You know, that depends a lot on um, where you live, on the weather that you're used to, um, also how long you're gonna be out. You know, I have patients who live up here in the Northeast who um, spend the winters down in Florida and they find that you know, on hot days that they might get a little bit lightheaded or dizzy. And so that's part of the reason why uh, you know, they divide the year between the Northeast and Florida. You avoid the extremes of weather in both directions. Carbohydrate heavy meals can cause your blood pressure to drop. I already mentioned if you've been sitting down or you are um, lying down for a long period of time. Dehydration is a big, big factor because as we talked about, in addition to what our body can normally do to compensate for blood pressure, it depends a lot on blood volume. And so if you get dehydrated and your blood volume is even a little bit down, you may be more likely to get dizzy. Physical exertion through exercise, again, can sometimes cause a blood pressure drop. It seems a little bit paradoxical. You would think that when you're exercising, it will cause your blood pressure to go up. But just because of the way that our blood vessels respond, it can actually cause a paradoxical drop. And then when people strain, you're having a bowel movement or um, urinating, that can cause symptoms like this. And so it's just something to be aware of because if you're sitting down, um, if you're going to the bathroom, you have to be a little careful when you first stand up that the blood pressure doesn't become a problem. So let's talk a little bit about how we diagnose NOH. So the first time a person may realize that their blood pressure or their heart rate is a little bit off might be when you come to the doctor's office. Now, most of the time when you go to see the internist or to see your cardiologist, they will measure your vital signs when you're sitting, but they may not measure them when you're standing. And so if you are having a symptom like this, it's important to let the medical assistant know because they may find orthostatic hypotension even if your vital signs in a sitting position are completely normal. 
a way that you can do this at home is to get yourself a blood pressure cuff and to check it on your own. And I find that for many people, this is actually more informative than what we're able to do in the office because what we really care about is how your blood pressure fluctuates under normal circumstances in part in terms of your day-to-day -day activities, not so much what happens during the one time every three or six months that you come to the office. So if you have a blood pressure cuff at home, you can just check your blood pressure and your heart rate, um, stand up, wait for a few minutes and recheck it and then see what happens. What we're looking for is a drop in blood pressure and most people with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension like Parkinson's disease will find that the blood pressure drops, but the heart rate is relatively unchanged. In other words, your heart rate is not able to compensate for the drop in blood pressure uh, in order to keep it up. If you find when you check your blood pressure and your heart rate at, at home that your blood pressure is dropping, but your heart rate is also going up, what that tells you is that your heart is trying to compensate, but it's not able to do it adequately. That might be a sign that you need to drink more fluid because that combination of drop in blood pressure and increased heart rate, it can be a sign of dehydration. Once you and your doctor have recognized the presence of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, you want to review your medications and make sure that you're not on any medicines that might cause this problem. Many people are on blood pressure medicines because their blood pressure is too high, and that might be the right treatment for years. But at some point, if the NOH becomes a problem, that blood pressure uh, medication that was really helpful to you um, in the past might now be contributing to the problem. Depending on the situation, it might be necessary to evaluate for other causes of orthostatic hypertension checking an EKG, an echocardiogram, and an ultrasound of the heart to make sure that those are working properly. Sometimes your doctor may check blood tests. And then if all of that is, um, doesn't show a clear cause, in some cases, there may be a role for more specialized testing. Uh, there are a, a series of tests that are called autonomic function tests where you would go to your medical facility or hospital and they would do some provocative tests to look for um, abnormalities in autonomic system function, including one that's called the tilt table test, where they will change your position very quickly um, and measure the blood pressure response. There's also options to do 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. Uh, it's not something we do all the time. And in my experience, I often find that if we can make a diagnosis of orthostatic hypotension in another way, especially in the context of established PD, some of these specialty tests may not necess be necessary. So we're gonna talk now um, about managing neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, and there's four steps to this. The first step is to modify or remove any medications that can cause NOH. Because if this is already a symptom that you're experiencing and you're on medicines that could make it worse, well, the first step is to try and reduce or stop those medicines if possible. Many of these are obvious. Many of these are the antihypertensive agents, the medicines that we use to treat blood pressure normally when it's high. Uh, these can be beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors. Um, you see the list of some of them. This is not a um, you know, fully inclusive list. Um, also, there are medicines that are sometimes used to get rid of extra fluid, diuretics. Sometimes they're because people are having problems with their heart or sometimes they are just used because people are retaining fluid for other reasons. And diuretics like furosemide or what's called Lasix, hydrochlorothiazide, these are medicines that can be effective for reducing fluid overload by helping you urinate and get rid of some of the fluid. But if NOH is a problem, getting rid of some of that fluid may leave you a little bit volume depleted or dehydrated in a way that can make these blood pressure issues even worse. There are a number of other ones that I list here. These are the alpha-1 blockers. These are often used uh, for people who are experiencing benign um, prostate hypertrophy. Uh, some of the antidepressants. These PDE5 inhibitors are those that are used most often for erectile dysfunction. So these are the generic names for medicines like Viagra or Levitra or Cialis. And so those can cause blood pressure uh, drops and in the context of NOH, um, they can sometimes pose a significant problem. 
I want to spend just a moment and highlight this group, the dopamine agents, because these are the ones that most people who have had Parkinson's disease for any length of time are taking. Levodopa is the active medication in Cinemet. Dopamine agonists like pramipexol, ropinirol, and rotigotine all can lower blood pressure in a way that in the context of NOH can sometimes become more symptomatic. The agonists tend to be more of a problem than levodopa. And so if people are on a combination of levodopa and dopamine agonists to treat their Parkinson's symptoms, but are now starting to develop symptoms related to drops in blood pressure, one of the first steps that um, your doctor might want to consider is to try to reduce the amount of dopamine agonist. In that context, if the Parkinson's symptoms get worse, you can sometimes make up for it by increasing your levodopa or your cinematose a little bit. But this is all a balance. And this is, I think, why it's so important for you to recognize these symptoms and have an open discussion with your doctors about them. Because it's not always an easy decision because changing one medication can affect other symptoms in addition to hopefully improving your blood pressure. The next step to um, managing neurogenic orthostatic hypotension are what we call non-pharmacologic measures. These are ones that don't involve taking more medication. Most important thing is to stay well hydrated, okay? And I think that, again, when people are dehydrated, that is probably the number one factor that's going to uh, make symptoms of orthostatic hypotension worse. So, I recommend all my patients stay well hydrated, but if this is a problem for you, you should drink a minimum of 64 ounces. That's about two liters a day. Um, there is an interesting treatment that can be helpful. If you drink two cups of water quickly within five minutes, that by itself can sometimes cause the blood pressure to go up for a little bit of time. And so if you are uh, sitting down at a meal, you're feeling a little bit woozy, you can try to drink some couple of cups of water and that can help raise the blood pressure in the short term. Another way to raise your blood pressure uh, is by increasing your salt intake. That's the reason why your doctor, if you do have high blood pressure, will encourage you to minimize your salt. But when there's extra salt in our body, that helps our body hold on to water better. It helps prevent dehydration. And so you can add um, a little bit extra salt to your meal or uh, salt sodium chloride is available as tablets that can be prescribed. And sometimes the combination of liberalizing fluid intake and salt intake by itself can be enough to um, make blood pressure symptoms a little bit more manageable. But it's really important before you do that, especially if there's any history of problems with excess fluid retention or heart failure to talk to your doctor about it. Because again, you don't wanna trade one problem for another. These are some of the counter maneuvers that you can find um, that may be helpful for orthostatic hypotension. So if you're standing up, you feel a little bit lightheaded, let's say you're standing in the grocery line or you're out and sitting down isn't something that you can do immediately. These are some things that can help. If you stand up on your toes, cross your legs, it causes your muscles and your legs to tighten a little bit. That helps improve the blood flow return from your legs up to the rest of the body. And so these are ways that you can temporize a little bit if you're feeling lightheaded or dizzy. Best thing to do to prevent yourself from fainting is to sit down, lie down, get your legs up. But if that's not an option, these are some maneuvers that you can do to try to help uh, temporize a little bit. The other way to try and help deal with orthostatic hypotension in a way that does not involve taking more medicine are compressive garments. Now, um, the whole idea here is to, again, help get blood flow from the rest of your body back to your heart so it can get up to the brain. So compressive stockings are one way to do that. The best type of compressive stockings are ones that go all the way up to your waist or at least up to your thigh. If you use knee-high compressive stockings, they don't really do a lot here. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of my patients tell me that, you know, when we try these, they're very, very hard to put on, they're hard to take off, they're uncomfortable, but this is a way to deal with orthostatic hypotension in a way that doesn't necessarily involve taking more medication. And there are patients that I see who tell me that they can't wear these all the time and we'll compromise and we'll say, you know what, when you're at home, if you're able to sit down or lie down, maybe you don't need these but if you're gonna go out or you're planning to be up on your feet for a longer period of time, it's worthwhile thinking about. 
Some people will also use an abdominal binder where you basically put like a tight corset around your abdomen. Again, the, the principle is still the same. And for some people, a combination of a binder and compressive stockings may be a way to manage blood pressure before you have to resort to taking medication. So if you've tried those steps and the lightheadedness or dizziness is still a problem or your blood pressure is still dropping in ways that can't be controlled, it may be time to talk to your uh, doctor about medications. And so there are a few different options here. One medicine that can help orthostatic hypotension is fludrocortisone. Fludrocortisone works on your kidneys to promote salt and water retention. And so um, it allows your body to hold on to more salt it expands the amount of volume in your bloodstream and can be a relatively mild uh, treatment for this type of problem. The problem with that is that because you're retaining more fluid, it may cause swelling and especially swelling in the legs where the fluid has a tendency to pool. Another problem that can sometimes arise from fludrocortisone is that your body by holding on to salt will release or excrete more potassium into your urine. And so some people who are on fludrocortisone may find that their potassium level goes down and you have to either take potassium supplements or think about ways to keep that up. The last side effect that I've listed here, supine hypertension, is a problem that can happen with any of the medicines we're gonna talk about. And uh, I'll uh, share a little bit more about that at the end of the talk. The next medication that we often use to treat orthostatic hypotension is a medicine called mitodrine. Mitodrine works directly on the blood vessels to cause them to constrict. And so uh, if your blood pressure is dropping, one way to try to bring the pressure up is basically to tighten up the blood vessels, help the blood flow get back to the heart and to the brain. And so mitodrine is a very potent vasoconstrictor that can do that. Um, Mitodrine is a fairly short-acting medication, and so it may be dosed one or several times a day. And for people who are finding that their blood pressure drops when they take their Parkinson's medicines, it can sometimes help to dose mitodrine either at the time you're taking your levodopa or um, maybe just before you take your levodopa. Um, it usually takes about 30 to 60 minutes to kick in, and then it can last about two to four hours. And so, again, in Parkinson's disease, because the low blood pressure tends to be a problem that's worst in the morning, some people will get by by taking a dose of mitodrine early in the day and may not need any more later on in the day. You want to be very careful about taking these medicines too close to bedtime or before lying down for a nap, because these medicines do not only increase the blood pressure when you're standing, but they also increase the blood pressure when you're sitting or lying down. And so in order to maintain a good standing blood pressure, it may cause your supine, your lying down blood pressure to be too high. And you don't wanna avoid that being a problem by not lying down too long or too much after you take one of these medicines. There's another medication that is um, available mostly to treat another neurological condition called myasthenia, but a medicine called pyrotostigmine can actually have some benefits for um, orthostatic hypotension as well. This works directly at the synapses, at the nervous connections that um, regulate blood pressure. Um, when the orthostatic hypotension is very severe, pyrotostigmine may not be as effective. And, um, but it, at the same time, the thought is that unlike mitodrine, which can cause the supine blood pressure to be very high, in theory, the pyrotostigmine may be less likely to cause that blood pressure to go up. And so for people who are experiencing both episodes of low blood pressure, as well as very high blood pressure, a medicine like protostigmine might be a better option than mitodrine. There are a number of side effects to this medication, abdominal cramping, diarrhea, drooling, excessive sweating. So these are things like any medicines you have to watch out for if your doctor prescribes them to you. And then the last medication that is approved for the treatment of NOH is a medicine called Droxydopa. It's uh, branded as Northera. Uh, this is a medication that is a precursor to norepinephrine, which is a neurotransmitter in our body that regulates a number of different functions, including um, uh, vasoconstriction. And so uh, uh, Droxydopa, again, is a medicine that's taken multiple times a day, and like mitodrine, it's important to avoid taking it too close to bedtime or before lying down. 
often your doctor may try one medication, see if it works. And then if it doesn't work, um, substitute a different one. In some cases, it may be necessary to use a combination of these pharmacologic measures because they don't work all by the same mechanism. And so in some cases, the combination may be more effective than any one alone. I just wanna close with a couple of unique situations. One is what we refer to as postprandial hypotension. And I alluded to this a little bit earlier. After a big meal, your body responds by diverting blood to your digestive tract to allow you to be able to digest the food. But by doing that, there may be less blood pressure that's getting to the rest of the body. And so if you eat a carbohydrate rich meal, or especially if you uh, have it with alcohol, after the meal, your blood pressure may drop a little bit. And so some people will find that they feel lightheaded or woozy or even faint just sitting at the dinner table without standing. So that's not orthostatic because you haven't stood up, but it is postprandial hypotension. And then if you add on that, you stand up after your meal, that combination may be even more likely to provoke an episode of dizziness or fainting. The ways you can manage postprandial hypotension are to eat smaller, more frequent meals, avoid alcohol with your meals. As we talked about before, you can drink a couple of cups of water quickly before or during the meal. And you can try and alleviate this a little bit by take, avoid taking your Parkinson's medications too close to meals. In other words, what you're trying to do is to separate out different components that may cause your blood pressure to drop. I wanna take a moment and just talk a little bit about supine hypertension because we've talked a lot about low blood pressure and the problems that that can cause, but the autonomic symptoms that occur with Parkinson's disease are not just going to result in low blood pressure, but they're going to result in abnormal blood pressure regulation, which can sometimes cause blood pressure to be too high. So the definition of supine hypertension is if your systolic blood pressure is over 140 or your diastolic blood pressure is over 90 after you've been lying down for more than five minutes. And the challenge here is that the medications that we talked about previously to treat neurogenic orthostatic hypotension can also increase supine blood pressure. And when your blood pressure goes too high when you lie down, people might get a headache, they might get a sense of flushing. You sit up, your blood pressure drops a little bit, you start to feel a little bit better. And this balance becomes a real push and pull. It becomes, uh, can be very difficult to manage these symptoms. And, and sometimes you, the perception of your neurologist and your cardiologist or internist might be different. You know, as a neurologist, one of my main goals is to help people stay active and live the lifestyle that they want. And if you're not able to stand up and walk around, then that's obviously going to interfere with that goal. And so it may be necessary to keep your blood pressure a little higher when you're sitting or lying down so that when you stand up, it doesn't drop too much. Internists and cardiologists are programmed to not want your blood pressure to be too high. And so they might see a blood pressure of 150 sitting that drops to 100 standing. They may focus on the sitting blood pressure and they say, you know what, we don't really want your blood pressure to be that high. Give you some medicines to lower your blood pressure. And this might be necessary, especially if you're somebody who has other risk factors for heart disease or stroke. But this push and pull is something that can sometimes be a challenge. There are a few strategies that you can use to minimize supine hypertension. One, as we talked about before, be careful and try to avoid lying down for at least a few hours after you take medication that's gonna bring your blood pressure higher. If you sleep with the head of your bed up, that can sometimes help with this problem of supine hypertension. The other advantage of that is that actually when your head of the bed is up, it may reduce the, um, the need to urinate in the middle of the night. A lot of people struggle with um, having to get up multiple times to urinate. And so if you keep your head of your bed up a little bit, that might reduce not only your lying down, your supine blood pressure, but also reduce the uh, overnight urinary frequency. And then in some cases, we might need a little bit of a short acting blood pressure medicine actually to lower the blood pressure later in the day or overnight. And it seems a little bit paradoxical. We give people blood pressure medicines to bring it up during the early part of the day and give blood pressure medicines that go the other way to lower blood pressure at the end of the day. But in some cases that turns out to be necessary. And when the situation uh, like that arises, then you have to really work closely 
with whichever doctor you are um, is helping you with your blood pressure management. So just to summarize, uh, fluctuations in blood pressure are very common in the context of Parkinson's disease. These can be due to the underlying disease itself, but can be aggravated by a variety of medications, including those that you're prescribed to treat your Parkinson's symptoms. It's really important to recognize the symptoms associated with orthostatic hypotension. And oftentimes you at home are gonna be in the best position to recognize these symptoms more than the doctor or the nurse or the medical assistant when you come to the office. When the symptomatic orthostatic hypotension becomes a problem, a combination of pharmacologic, medication-based, or non-pharmacologic strategies may be helpful. And it's also important to recognize that in the context of PD, supine hypertension, where your blood pressure is too high, can also be a problem. And that can also affect your lifestyle and make management and balance of your medications that much more challenging. So with that, thank you for your attention. Uh, I am happy to take any questions and uh, good luck at home during these uh, strange times and uh, I wish you all the best. Great, thank you Dr. Hong for that fantastic presentation. We do already have some questions for you and just as a reminder to our participants, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A chat function and we'll get through them as time allows. Our first question for you Dr. Hong, for someone who has been experiencing Parkinson's related orthostatic hypotension for a number of years, is there an increased risk in stroke, heart attack, or other issues? That is a great question. You know, I think that when we think about blood pressure issues, um, we have to think about them not just in the context of PD, but in the context of other medical issues as well. So if a person has a history of stroke or heart attack or other risk factors, that may affect the way that we try and manage their blood pressure issues. Because on the one hand, giving medicines to try to bring the blood pressure up may be good for their Parkinson's or for their NOH, but could put more strain on the heart and increase the risk of other, um, other medical issues. So, you know, I think that the bottom line is what we are trying to do is to help people feel their best, do their best, while minimizing the risks of complications. And that's not easy. But I would say that um, you have to focus on those things that are bothersome to you. If you have mild neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, but you can manage without medicines, and uh, especially if there's a history of stroke or heart attack, the prudent thing to do may be not to add more medicine. But if you get to the point that even if there is a risk of some of these cardiovascular events, if you are having to curtail your lifestyle because every time you get up, you feel like you're gonna faint. That might swing the balance in the other direction and think about, you might have to think about treating the NOH a little bit more aggressively. Great, thank you. Another question we have, is there a natural way to treat blood pressure issues? My husband with PD has started drinking water in the morning with a half a teaspoon of salt. This seems to have helped. Yep, I think that's the best way to start. You know, I think that before you resort to taking medications, use some of the non-pharmacologic strategies that we talked about. Um, make sure that you maintain good hydration. Um, the salt can help. Um, realize that that can also depend on the situation. So if you're going to go out for a walk during the summer, bring some water with you. Um, Gatorade or something with some salt is another option. But um, I think that what I hope you take from this is that um, if you're aware of the symptoms of neurogenic orthostatic hypertension, there may be things that you can do yourself even without asking your doctor that might make your life better. Great. My husband has autonomic dysfunction. His, his blood pressure drops so low sometimes he passes out in the morning. Any suggestions? Again, it's basically the issues that we've talked about. I think that if the blood pressure is dropping so low that he's fainting, this might be a time that you need to think about medication, either in isolation or in combination. And this is when you need to talk to your doctor, figure out which doctor on your medical team is going to take the lead. Sometimes it's the cardiologist, sometimes it's the internist, sometimes it's the neurologist. Find out who's going to take the lead in helping you. But if fainting is a consistent problem, um, it's time to think about being a little bit more aggressive. Great. If Cinemet seems to be causing low blood pressure, what else can be done? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think that obviously we all love Cinemet in the right context because it allows the motor symptoms to be better. Um, if this issue comes up, you know, the first 
um, option is to try and reduce the Cinemet dose. If you can reduce the Cinemet dose and improve the blood pressure issues without making motor symptoms worse, then that's great. Mm -hmm. But for most people working with your Parkinson's specialist, there's a reason that you got to the Cinemet dose that you did. And that is because the lower doses weren't controlling your motor symptoms adequately. And if that's the case, you know, I think that I will generally say, well, you know, if you need this dose of Cinemet, then we need to stay with it and we'll use the other strategies around it. And so people who are on Cinemet and doing okay motorically, um, but having problems with blood pressure, then we'll start thinking about that, uh, you know, those four steps to trying to improve the blood pressure regulation. Right. Thank you. I need my levodopa, even though I have NOH, how do I manage my other Parkinson's symptoms? Yep, I think same question. Basically, you have to prioritize and you have to work with your doctors and realize that there's always a balance. You know, many people are aware of the balance when it comes to the motor symptoms. You know, if you don't take enough medication, you feel off. If you take too much medication, you may develop dyskinesias. I would think of the NOH in a way as being another symptom of being on too much medication, you know, but too much may be the right amount, you know. So even if you're on a higher dose of Cinemet, if that's what you need to control your motor symptoms, then I think you stay with that and then you try to find other strategies to address the blood pressure. Great. And I think we have our last question here, Dr. Hung. How do I manage low diastolic pressure at about 60 that is not significantly altered by standing up from a sitting position? So um, everybody's diastolic blood pressure is different. And so uh, diastolic blood pressure of 60 may not be abnormal. Okay. And I think that um, what I counsel my patients about is when we are trying to treat symptoms of NOH, the focus is on treating the symptoms, not treating the blood pressure. So some patients will tell me that, you know, when I check my blood pressure at home, it drops by 30 or 40 points. And I ask them, well, how do you feel? And they say, well, I feel fine. The only reason I know is because I checked my blood pressure. We don't need to treat orthostatic hypotension based on the numbers unless they're causing symptoms. And so I think to this particular question, a diastolic blood pressure of 60, for most people, I think is pretty good. And so, especially if it doesn't stand, if it doesn't change with standing, I wouldn't call it an orthostatic problem. Um, if your blood pressure is 80 over 60, and you're feeling symptomatic, I might suspect that it's the lower systolic blood pressure that's causing problems rather than the lower, lower diastolic pressure. So again, it's one of those things to monitor, to follow with your doctors. Um, my advice to patients, if you're having these symptoms, have a blood pressure cuff at home, have it on hand to check occasionally. But if you're feeling okay, don't be overly compulsive about checking it over and over and over during the day. Anybody's blood pressure is going to fluctuate some. And I find that when people start to get too worried about their blood pressure and they check it two, three, four, five, six times a day or you know, at, at, you know, every 15 or 30 minutes, that by itself is going to affect your blood pressure measurements because you're gonna get anxious and that's gonna bring your blood pressure up. So um, if you're feeling well, know that you have or don't have neurogenic orthostatic hypotension but go about your lifestyle in a way where you don't focus in on it too much. If you are having symptoms, this is the time to talk to your doctor, figure out what the problem is, figure out how you balance that with treatment of your other medical issues or treatment of your Parkinson's disease and uh, work with them to help you feel your best. Great, thank you all for your questions. This Q&A segment concludes today's presentation. For anyone whose questions we did not get to, please call our helpline at one 800 for PD info and a Parkinson's specialist will be happy to help you. Dr. Hung, again, we can't thank you enough for joining us today from Mass General Hospital, a Parkinson's Center of Excellence and sharing this valuable information with our PD community. I Thanks very much again. And uh, you know, I wish you all well, stay safe, stay well. Thank you, Dr. Hung. I also wanna thank each of you who took the time to tune into today's program. We hope you'll join us for other upcoming PD Health at Home programs discussing topics that matter most to you. You can browse upcoming programs and find a recording of today's Take Time Thursday on parkinson.org slash pdhealth. We appreciate your continued participation and hope you'll join us for next week's Take Time Thursday on June 11th, focusing on using physical medicine to reduce PD pain.
Thank you again to today's generous sponsor, Accorda Therapeutics. The Parkinson's Foundation makes life better for people living with Parkinson's disease by improving care and advancing research towards a cure. In everything we do, we build on the energy, experience, and passion of our global Parkinson's community. To learn more about additional resources, remember to visit our website at parkinson.org or call our helpline at 1-800-4PD-INFO. As we sign off, please join us on camera to wave farewell until next time to your Parkinson's community. Thank you again for joining and we hope to see you next week. Bye everyone.